What's up, everybody? How you doing? Terrence here for a special edition of the Northeast Podcast, but I'm not by myself. I have two amazing people. I have Becca with me. Y'all know Becca. Becca is amazing. She's one of my cohorts here and one of my favorite people in the world, so I'm glad that she's a part of the podcast. <laughs> but we also have a special guest. We have Molly Halpin with us. Molly of Fearless Grace LLC. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Molly has become a friend of ministry of ours. She was a part of ministry here last year with our back to school mental health workshop and she's joining us today for this very special episode about what becca we are going to be talking about mental health and kids um we hope that for the parents in our church um grandparents anyone who is you know in that parental role in somebody's life that this podcast is just a resource to them as they navigate the school year with their kids and just everything that comes along with that. So Molly, to start, would you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. uh, So my name is Molly Ann Halpin, um, soon to be Molly Ann Teco. I recently got married. Um, I am originally from Texas. I moved here to Kentucky in 2015 for school. I went to Asbury Seminary. Um, Initially, I started out in the Master of Divinity program, um, but uh, my father passed away in the first 10 weeks, and with that, I started going to counseling, and I just really loved it and loved the relationship that came from that, Um, and I felt God put a calling on my heart that this is actually where I was called to be, Um, and so I added the mental health counseling degree to my to my program. And then the very last year, I was five classes away from a second one. And so I went ahead and I grabbed marriage and family therapy just to really nerd out. Um, So uh, I moved up here to Louisville with my now husband. um, And I am a licensed professional clinical counselor and a licensed marriage and family therapist. A whole bunch of mumbo jumbo. Um, Basically, though, I talk with teenagers all day. I talk with couples and I talk with families about what all's going on, what's going right, where do they need some help. Um, Just get to hear people's stories and talk about, you know, what can we do to get them where they want to be? Wow. Well, you know, that's awesome. I, I like to think of you said a lot of titles. I like to think of counselors as really good friends. And so I think that's a good title. Maybe on your Instagram, put that in there and like, <laughs> All your other titles and then friend at the end. That's the cool thing to do. I got a question for you. Before we even get into the thing, this is just a hot button topic around the office around here. Uh, Catherine, if you're listening to this, you know this, this one is for you. Um, <laughs> as a person from Texas, is Texas Roadhouse Texas worthy? Ooh. Ooh. Those rolls, though. I mean, well, that's kind of like going to Canes and getting the Texas toast. Okay. Okay. Um. It's good, but like being from Texas, everything is better in Texas. All right, all right. So that's <laughs> we knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> the stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. All right, okay. I lived in Texas for a little while, so I got I got respect for Texas. We said my kids said the pledge to the Texas flag, oh, which yeah. was a new experience wow. for me. Oh yeah, every day. <laughs> Kindergarten through 12th grade. Really? Yeah, oh, you man. say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, and then you offer your Texas pledge. <laughs> I love Texas. So I'm, I'm glad Texas gifted you, gifted us you. And so welcome to our podcast room. We're going to jump in. I, I had to take a sidetrack. Y'all know how my yeah. brain works. Yeah. So I had to go down that road. <laughs> so here's my first question. We got a whole list of questions here, folks. So we're going to get through some of these questions. Here's the first one. Uh, when it comes to mental health uh, for our kids, you know, when we think about, you know, helping our kids be centered, mind, body, and soul, uh, what in your mind are some of the essential building blocks for a parent or a grandparent or a small group leader, anybody that's kind of shepherding youth? What are some of the essential building blocks in your mind to mm-hmm. help do that? I think a big thing is really asking yourself, how are you helping to build that solid foundation? What are you already doing that's working well for you and your child Um, or you and whichever child is in your care and whatever relationship context you're looking at? Um, Some big things are how are you modeling behavior for them? Because as adults, we all have bad days. As a therapist, I've got bad days. So how do I model for my nieces and my nephews, you know, when I have a bad day or when I need a break from kids or whatever it is, 
how do I set that boundary well and set it kindly? Um, one of my favorite words is how are you doing that kindly? Um, I just appreciate that because um, I, I saw a family that I used to babysit for use that word all the time and their kids are very respectful. Um, <clears throat> they have two teenage daughters that are actually very kind to each other, which is kind of impressive. <laughs> <Same>. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but being a solid foundation for kids, especially in different times of transition, is are you there when they need you? And can you help them? Can you be honest? So sometimes as adults, we don't always have the question or the answer, and that's okay to offer that of, hey, buddy, I don't know what is going to happen, but here's what I do know. And finding confidence in the things that we do know, Christ's love, we know that. We know his word is true. Um, so speaking those truths over our children and over the kids, um, that's a really big piece of it. One of my favorite things to do um, with some of my, particularly with my Christian clients, is encouraging them to journal. Journaling is a really great exercise. A lot of people, even my adults, look at it as busy work, but it's not. Um, the beauty of journaling is that you're externalizing all of the mumbo jumbo in your head. Um, you're getting it out in paper. And typically when we do that, by the end of a five minute, 10 minute journal session, it it all starts to kind of make sense. And you can usually feel a difference after you've done it a couple of days consistently. Another big thing is um, encouraging your kids to set boundaries, not only with their friends, but even for themselves. Um, the way that I like to ask this question um, personally, because as a therapist, I love people. And so I will take on 70 clients <laughs> and that's not healthy. Yeah. Right. Um, so what is my limit? What is my limit for myself? Because sometimes boundary is not a fun word. And so I'll I'll talk with my niece in particular. She's eight years old. She's one of my favorite little buddies. Um, actually, I think she's nine now. But, um, you know, I'll say, hey, Aria, um, you know, what's your limit here when it comes to, you know, sharing your toys with your sister? Because she's got a younger sister who just wants to be all about big sis. Um, what is your limit? What what are the toys that are really important to you that if something were to happen, you're not going to be comfortable or you're going to be really upset? And she'll pick out like two or three toys and then the rest she knows to to share with her little sister or her little brother. Um, and the other thing that I would really encourage um, is giving language to feelings and helping your kids. You know, feelings language is not everybody's go to. <laughs> Again, yeah. even as adults, I don't know many of us that walk up to yeah. each other and say, oh, I feel rough today. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when you say, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So being able to slow down and do some check-ins. Um, dinner table time is always a great time for that. Um, but giving feeling language. Disney just recently came out with Inside Out 2. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my jam. I love to encourage <laughs> parents, go watch that with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just help them put language to what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, usually kids are just looking for a sounding board and looking for parents to acknowledge, yeah, I see you. And yeah, it's a tough day and it's hard to make good decisions on tough days. Mm -hmm. That's so. good. That's good. You know, I, I'm sitting here uh, thinking about that. Um, and it sounds like the, the underlying thing here is a part of giving your kids uh, a good, um, uh, platform, I guess, for good mental health is uh, making sure that they understand their value mm -hmm. and training them in personal autonomy about how they feel, mm -hmm. not invalidating feelings, not because they're a child. You know, one of the things that's kind of prevalent uh, when I was growing up was we would always hear like, hey, stay in a child's place or like, hey, that doesn't matter. And I think sometimes that's appropriate, right? Like sometimes when I'm having a conversation with my wife and my son walks in, he's in our conversation. He's I'm like, bro, stay in a child's place. This is not, this is not a conversation for you. Get out of here. But at, at certain times though, I think a child's place is actually right there with you yeah. being honest about how they feel. Mm -hmm. And I think creating a space for your kids to feel safe mm -hmm. in their, and their emotions and feelings with you is a good foundation to prevent maybe some mental health issues down the road. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I feel like I'm here. Yeah. What do you got, Becca? Yeah, I'm just thinking about um, how, for me, I have two boys, and one of them, 
is like if we start talking about emotions, um, it's like shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other one is like telling me how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm like, whoa, (laughs) whoa. Um, And so just how the modeling I feel like has been the biggest thing, especially with the one who's not as forthcoming Mm -hmm. um, with the emotions going on inside. And so um, and I feel like for me, that was actually modeled for me with my mom is she would come and have conversations about different things that were going on. And she would be honest, like where it was appropriate, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. giving me the information that was appropriate for my age level and Mm -hmm. stage of life. Um, And. I, that has been really impactful to me. And I remember thinking, oh, like my my mom is really complex as a person and is experiencing this wide range and was being honest about it. And so I've noticed that um, just the modeling really has for us because my kids are still really young. Um, that has been what has seemed to be the most beneficial is to say, man, I'm feeling whatever it is and mm-hmm. trying to use um you know, more than just those really basic things, those mm-hmm. basic feeling words, but trying to really put a uh, more advanced language to it to show that, yeah, we, I, I get it. I'm with you. Like sometimes something happens. I'm like, I feel so frustrated right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just been, it's opened up some doors mm-hmm. where for one of them that wouldn't necessarily be like a, a normal thing, but I've, we've seen some fruit from that. And that's just been, I'm really glad. Um, but I'm also like, Ooh, how, what's this going to look like <laughs> as I get older? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, just thank you for sharing those building blocks. Cause I think that we can make that more complicated sometimes than it needs to be. Um, but just those regular everyday moments mm-hmm. um, of of taking advantage of that. And I feel like you were saying that and that's what you mm-hmm. were saying as well, Terrence, of just just be ready. Just be ready to take advantage of those. Mm. And just to add on to that too, empathy and that validation of feelings, that doesn't mean that you're agreeing with their choices. Empathy doesn't equal agreement. Empathy just says, I see how you got to where you are. I see what you're seeing. Can I maybe shift your perspective (laughs) that maybe we don't throw the teddy bear when we're upset, but maybe instead you come ask mom or dad for help. But in order to be able to help people get to the place where they can shift, they have to be able to regulate in the first part of it, which is their emotion, especially for kids you know, kids, tiny little bodies and those big emotions, they get big quick. So when you empathize with them first before trying to correct them or steer them away, unless it's a safety situation or something bigger where, you know, you need to intervene immediately, but to empathize with them, you know, it sounds like you're really struggling with your friends and your feelings really got hurt. Um, I know that's really tough for you because I know like you and Sarah are besties. And so it's just not fun when your friend's not talking to you. And typically that's when kids will kind of start to open up. And then you can say, you know, is there something that maybe looking back on the situation you might do differently Um, just to kind of build that conversation? But by you empathizing with them, the biggest thing is you're being present to them and to their experience. And that's how you build that that attachment, that secure attachment that most parents want with their children. Mm. That's good. All right, so let's shift a little bit to think about some of our preteen and teens. You know, they're, they're back into school, you know, um, for some of them, re-entering relationships that were established, uh, maybe in new schools, establishing new relationships, mm-hmm. new teachers, a lot of new things. Uh, what are some warning signs uh, that you could say parents should look for when their kids come home after school and they're around a the dinner table, maybe in the car, and they're tr- uh, maybe just different behaviors around the home? What are some things that parents can be looking for to signal to themselves that there might be something going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, If you see changes in their relationships, like specifically with friends that they were once really close to, that would be a big conversation starter for me of, hey, what's going on, buddy? Because that's you guys are all usually really close. You used to go hang out on the weekends. What happened? Um, And sometimes those are actually like really good shifts. I've had clients before that have shared, you know, they started making poor choices that I know that I didn't want to um, participate in. And so I decided to to just not, Um, in which case that's great, you know. 
that parent did really well instilling excellent yeah. values <laughs> and some good solid individualism there. Um, but then the other, the big red flag, especially for counselors and therapists that we look out for um, and that when I'm working with my teenagers and preteens, are they isolating? And what do those peer relationships look like? Um, you want to be mindful of who your kids are hanging out with. Um, just kind of like we talk about here at church is, you know, whatever you put in your mind is also what's going to come out. And so who are your kids hanging out with? Um, and you know, it's a great question for you to ask yourself too, as an adult, who are the five people that I spend the most time with? Because Mm -hmm. those five people are going to be the ones that influence me most. And the same goes for your children, preteens, teens. Um, a big task for teenagers and preteens is being able to establish that social group. Um, and it, it's hard. I'll tell you, I love kids. I've been with working with kids in different settings for almost 20 years now. Um, and kids can be mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, yeah. they can sometimes they can. be kind of mean. It's true. <laughs> um, and so it's not easy for everybody to set those relationships and to find that person that they click with or find that group that they, you know, I guess the, the hot word is vibing. Yeah. You're vibing with this group. <laughs> <You're vibing. laughs> I cringe when they say that word. Oh, goodness. <laughs> the, the, re, the reuse of language is driving me crazy. That used to mean something else when I was when I was growing up. That meant that I was, like, trying to date somebody. Like, you know what I mean? Like, are we vibing right now? What's up? Like, what's going on? Now you use that. They're like, ew, don't say that. Like, I don't – it's too much language transition in this generation. But but continue, continue. You know. So, really, the big two, two pieces that I would pay attention to are they – what do their friend groups look like if they're able to establish them? And if not, then paying attention to that too and kind of helping them figure out where they can plug in. Extracurricular activities, great place for kids to make friends. Um, not to use busyness as a coping skill because you mm-hmm. also don't mm-hmm. want to teach that in this yeah, day and age, yeah. in this busy world. Um, but that's a great it's a it's a softer environment because there's usually less kids. They're all one way or another kind of encouraged to interact with each other, whether it's doing drills or, you know, an art project as a group. Um, That's kind of an easy in or finding some good volunteer opportunities. Youth group is another one that I encourage a lot of kiddos to. Um, the The big other red flag is just isolation. So if you see your kid pulling away, um, that's a pretty, that's a big indicator for therapists that we immediately hone in on. And we're like, okay, we got to figure out how to um, how to adjust this. Um, we are created to be in relationship with one another. And so when we don't have that relationship, um, we are not getting that feedback and that co-regulation that we need um, to to stay engaged. And so systems start shutting down. Um, mentally, the picture that I like to paint is um, it's an identity collapse. And so it's kind of like everything in your world slowly starts to, to fall down. Um, and then you have nothing. And you don't want your kids to be sitting in that. You don't want to sit in that. So, mm. wow. Um, are there certain things I when you're talking about isolation? Um, are there certain things that maybe parents need to help regulate in their kids' lives? I'm thinking like screens or like time inside. Like, what tips maybe would you give parents to help if they haven't already done that? Um, what are those things that lead to isolation or are Mm -hmm. things that, um, contribute to it? And then what would you tell them to like start with to make a shift in that? Mm -hmm. Um, some kind of fun, simple, nerdy things. And I know teenagers aren't usually the first ones to hop on this boat, but like family game nights, those are nice and just kind of changed the family dynamic a little bit. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, we were joking about Uno yeah. before we started, <laughs> um, but there's actually a lot of social skills that come from playing different games. Like with Uno, um, Terrence, you, <laughs> <laughs> you um, were joking about the draw fours and building resilience, but truly it's, it's yeah. actually listed in several therapy books. That's a great um, anger tolerance exercise. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Because you got dad sitting at the table who plays 10 draw fours. It's rough, man. <laughs> Take no prisoners. Right? Um, and then kind of like what you had mentioned earlier, uh, the screen time, Becca, that's a huge one. 
we have this false sense of connection of, hey, I really know what's going on in your world. You know what's going on in mine through our phones and that we're that much more connected. And yeah, you know, screens and phones, computers, tablets, all of it, they are beautiful blessings that, you know, centuries before have not had. Um, it's a very different world with all of them, though. And so being a parent in this age is not easy trying to figure those balances, but especially being a kid is not easy. Um, I'm sure that you guys all remember growing up, like the number one thing, do not post anything that you don't yeah. want to come back around yeah. 20 years from now. That's not the name of the game anymore. That doesn't really stick with a lot of kids these days. Um, but it gives that false sense of connection of, hey, I really know what's going on with my friends' lives and things like that. We all know that what's posted on social media, that's only a small snippet. Nobody's going to, not very many people at least, are going to go online and in a healthy perspective be able to post, I've had a really hard day today and could just use some prayers. There's a lot more conversation that comes out of that. Um and so I think the research suggests two hours of screen time limit for a day. Mm. Um, I'm sure if we all pulled out our phones That's right now, good. even as adults, we're no, all no, well still. over that. <laughs> no, no, still. Um, there's a beautiful book called The God-Shaped Brain by Timothy Jenkins or Jennings. I think it's Jennings. Um, and the one, I will never forget this one little sentence. And it describes how screen time, any kind of engagement with electronics, um, it charges our emotional reactivity as opposed to stimulating our critical thinking skills. Wow. So, Becca, you said you have boys? Yes. You have boys, too. I got three boys and a little girl. Okay. So I'm going to guess um, there's some video gaming going on oh, yeah. at y'all's house. Oh, yeah. yeah. My husband's still Only piece games. we get. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, though, when's the last time you had to go interrupt one of their games and how did they respond? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's never, it's never fun. <laughs> we have Alexa with alarms that warn them, hey, 15-minute warning, games yeah. got to go off and... Even to yeah. the minute, it's like, but, but, but. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we have a, most of the gaming happens on the Switch, and we have like the parental control set mm-hmm. um, where the timer goes <laughs> off and the game stops. Um, Ooh. And Ooh. my <laughs> oldest, like, he has to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, at first when we did it, we had it where literally the gaming system, it would just shut down. <laughs> And that was oh, man. not good. So we changed it to where he had to turn it off, mm-hmm. which we found was better because mm-hmm. then it was like he was doing it. And uh, but still, sometimes <laughs> it's really hard. That that alarm goes off, and then he's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. My my husband video games, and I'll be honest, I've had to go in there a couple of times and say, hey, babe. It's time to go. (laughs) And man, you know, in the middle of a video game, you're just really invested. Um, But those are really great examples, though, of how when you go to interrupt in that particular moment, their mind is in one direction, very invested in this particular spot. Um, That's that emotional reactivity, though, that you're going to get as a reaction as opposed to a response of, okay, I will hop off here in the next 30 seconds. (laughs) So um, finding other things to do, reading. I know everybody can, it's so easy to get your kids to read, I'm sure. Um, (laughs) um, But some of those things where we're engaging with each other, like family game night, um, going for a walk, any kind of physical activity. um, I think it's 30 minutes a day for five days a week. There's more benefits to physical activity for that duration than there are taking um, anti-psychotropic medications. Um, granted, no, that's not for everybody. So talk with your doctor if that's your situation. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to physical activity that, um, that our communities are missing out on right now. So that's good. Yeah. We, we did, we completed a summer 60 challenge over the summer that had a lot to do with getting outside, letting the sun hit you, moving your body around because we know that the, the research is out there, you know, the, interaction with outdoors Mm -hmm. has taken just as much of a hit as interaction with other people. Yeah. And we're just trying to break those habits from the screens and get back to how we were made. And, and I think a lot of mental health is getting back to how we were made and what we were made for. Mm -hmm. Um, Question I I want to throw out to you is, you know, looking back on your own life and, and the landscape of our society, maybe 
what advice would you give to parents to address their own mental health and their own fears mm-hmm. in this season of raising children? What what advice would you give to a parent? Mm. Do you guys have any examples of some fears that parents have offered a couple of or yeah. like more frequently? So I would say maybe a parent um, has a child that comes to them and says, I think I have anxiety. Mm-hmm. And all they know is that in society, you know, when anxiety comes up, that means there's a whole you know, bucket of other things that are attached to anxiety. <laughs> you know, uh, how do you help a parent navigate that? Maybe when they bring their kids to your office for the first, because I'm sure you talk to the parent first and they have a lot of things that come up. Mm-hmm. You know, what advice, what tips, what what would you give to a parent right now listening to this that is kind of wrestling through this? Number one thing, and it's the most repeated phrase in the Bible, don't be scared. <laughs> It's okay, because in all honesty, technically, we all have mental health. It's a difference of do we have mental health struggles or is our mental health pretty well managed and taken care of? Um, So, you know, if your kid approaches you and they share, hey, mom, dad, I I think I have this going on, um, I would actually really encourage just, you know, slow your roll. You don't have to, you don't have to have an answer right away. (laughs) You can say, okay, you know, tell me about it and take that disposition of curiosity and just ask questions. You know, when you say that you feel anxious, like, what does that mean for you? Um, And not that you're trying to challenge them that they need to prove it to you, but you're asking them, you know, what is their experience so that you can help them understand, okay, yeah, you know what? That sounds pretty serious. Maybe we need to bring somebody else in um, to to kind of help and assist with the situation. Or, you know what, maybe there's something that um, we can do differently at home to kind of help set you up for success. Um, you know, if it's anxiety about getting to school on time, you know, that's probably a really small one, but is it about getting to school on time? Um, then let's try to figure out how we can leave 15 minutes earlier. And that's probably, honestly, it's going to shift the night before. So we need to start going to bed 15 minutes earlier too. Um, but I would say opening that dialogue between you and your child and trying to figure out, you know, what are the pieces that they already know? Because the other thing to remember is, you know, Terrence, you called me the expert earlier. Um, I, I'm the expert with information, but you, your child, Becca, her children, y'all are all the experts on your experiences. So I am never going to trump that. Um, The same goes with your children. They are the experts on their experience. They might not have all the language yet, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong in their experience. And so by taking that time to listen to them, ask all the questions and validate them, um, you give ownership to them and accountability to them and also managing their mental health in a a positive and healthy way. Mm. Mm. That's good. That's good. You know, I've, I've kind of learned as a parent, you know, um, number one, the number one thing I've learned as a parent is um, I, I I now understand uh, my parents more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, I have yes. so much more grace for my parents as mm-hmm. I, I raise my own children. I just understand. Um, so some of the things that I maybe have gone to a counselor to talk about <laughs> and get the help for it because they didn't do so perfectly. Now that I'm a parent in their seat, I'm like, man, I get it. I understand. This is really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is I've learned that a lot of times, a lot of my fears and my that I have around my kids is really um, me responding to the mirror that they are to me. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I see my kids behaving or doing things and it just reminds me of some of the things that I don't like about myself mm-hmm. that I haven't brought under the Lordship of God that haven't been healed in me yet, that haven't been changed in me yet. And so a lot of times if I'm especially responding out of fear or erratically towards my kid, it usually has nothing to do with my kid. It is literally the me in them that is calling something out of me. And that has allowed me to take a seat, a step back at times and really um, be present with my kid in their unique situation. Because like you said, they don't have my story. They have their own unique story that they're writing now. And I have an opportunity as a parent to help them write that story Mm -hmm. in a positive way, Mm -hmm. not from, from my fear complex, but from a love bond. Mm -hmm. And I think that changes everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 When you were saying that, um, I, it made me think about how I often say like, um, when I first got married, I thought marriage was really sanctifying. But then when I had kids, I was like, 
this is even more sanctified. <laughs> like in marriage, I could still be kind of selfish in mm-hmm. a lot of ways because mm-hmm. like we're two adults. We could each kind of take care of ourselves if we needed to. But like with kids, that has been so sanctifying. Like I have had to sacrifice out of love for them. Like I do it because I love them and it's one way I show them love. But it's what you're saying about how like it really reveals things in me, Mm -hmm. um, things that God is still sanctifying in mm-hmm. my life, in my mm-hmm. flesh. I'm like, ooh, that's a little flesh right there. <laughs> like, that's not holiness. <laughs> that's not righteousness. That that's, ain't the Lord. <laughs> that is the flesh. And, uh, ooh, I mean, it's it's good. It's good that those are revealed, but um, it's also, it just, you know, leads me to Jesus mm-hmm. that much faster because I'm like, wow, there's so much that I still need to learn from God, mm-hmm. um, and I I want to do that because mm-hmm. I want that to pass that on to my kids. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's good. You know, we we could sit around here and we could we could talk all day, but we know that those listening to this podcast, you got things to do. You're probably still sitting <laughs> in the parking lot outside of work right now, your lunch break, waiting for this podcast to end. So we won't tarry much longer. This won't be like one of my sermons. I, we will get get to the close here. So this is the closing moment here, and we're going to go around and just each give uh, just one little tip or one little piece of advice, maybe something we do, maybe something we've read about, but just one thing that we want to encourage you to try, maybe at home with your kids, to help build some trust around mental health. And so I'll go first. One of the things that we do around our dinner table each night, we we learned it from a ministry called Axis. Um, Axis is a great ministry that helps you just learn how to raise your children in the Lord. And they have a lot of stuff that helps you build trust in relationship with your kids. And one of the things that we started doing about five years ago is this thing called High Low Buffalo. And so what High Low Buffalo is, is you sit around the dinner table, everybody gets seated and you just say, High Low Buffalo. And each person shares a high from their day, something that they, that made them happy or excited. They share a low from their day, something that made them disappointed, sad or scared. And then they share a buffalo and the buffalo is something weird or something that was surprising in their day. So you have to use some words to help your kids understand what you're asking for. But what we have found is that, uh, number one. When we ask that high, it forces our kids to stop and actually evaluate their day to say, there is something that I can be thankful for from today. Even Mm -hmm. if today was hard, there is something that I can point to to say I'm happy. Even if it was you made chicken nuggets for dinner tonight. It it just reminds them of something they can be happy about. The low creates an environment where their disappointment is safe to bring to the family. Um, And so there have been times where we've heard some lows around the dinner table that we've had to kind of slow down dinner to be present for one of the kids. And and me and my wife, we participate in this as well. So we get to also invite our kids in an appropriate way into the things that are disappointing us about life. And they get to be with us and sometimes have stopped and prayed for us. And then the Buffalo has been a great tool because this is how I've gotten intel about things that are (laughs) happening in school, things like different things that. You know, yeah. that I need to know about. And mm-hmm. your kids will tell you things if you ask in a, an appropriate way. Like, hey, what's something that was weird or something that just didn't feel right to your heart when it happened? And this will create a, a thought process in your kid's mind where they start thinking about what was there an interaction I had today that just didn't feel right? And before you know it, they'll begin to share things that you need to know, and then you can begin to respond as a parent. So I encourage you, try Hollow Buffalo. I think it will enhance your family dinner time, but also your trust and communication with your kids. Mm-hmm. What you got, Becca? Um, so the first thing that I was thinking of, so I, I have two things. Okay. I'll make them kind of <laughs> short. Um, the first thing is, When I notice that we're all, if it's like a family environment where we're all kind of like, what's going on? I'm like, we're getting outside right now. Mm -hmm. So you talked about getting outside and Mm -hmm. I was like, we're we're doing it. We're going outside. We're taking a walk or we're just going in the backyard. Like we're going to get ourselves outside and it almost immediately fixes everything Mm -hmm. Um, or at least gives space. Um, and then the second thing was um, we we actually we read a lot at my house. We read a lot of books. Um, and something that uh, I started doing was, um, especially with the picture books, was pointing 
to characters and when it's not explicit in the text saying what do you think they're feeling right now? Um, Because picture books often, you know, they have various expressions on their Mm -hmm. faces. And so um, I just let the kids say what they think. Don't try to correct them. Um, Just let them say what they think to kind of know where they're at. Like how one, how are they following along with the story? So it's kind of like a reading comprehension, but also just are they, recognizing emotions in other people Mm -hmm. um, to kind of build that just that vocabulary or if they don't say anything then I'll offer something but that's been really kind of interesting especially with my youngest um, as he just navigates the world and is paying attention he's the empath but so he was already kind of doing that but I was like let's do this intentionally (laughs) Um, so those are the two things for us that I feel like has been very helpful um, just to help re- one regulate our family um, and then two just help to grow their vocabulary around feelings and mm-hmm. emotions mm. so what about yeah. you Molly um I would say I'm, I'll be fast but I also have two things but they go under the theme of just slow down um, for adults uh, parents there's a great resource um, call or oh, it's a book um, to Hell with the Hustle and Hurry by Jeff Bethke, and he he co-authors it with somebody. Um, but they just talk about the fast pace um, needs and the rhythms of our of our world these days. Um, but I think that theme also really applies to our relationship with our kids. Um, and again, in whatever context. So what are you modeling, especially for teenagers? Because now, you know, the next step after teenagers is they're now young adults. And so they're going to repeat what you have modeled for them almost immediately. Um, and then for for kiddos, um, it only takes 30 minutes a week to build a secure attachment. So You can break that up into two 15 or three 10 minute segments, but 10 minutes, three times a week, however you choose to do it. But those 30 minutes that you can devote one on one attention to your child and turn off all devices, put it down, like peeking over at your phone, that's cheating. You just lost (laughs) your 10 minutes and now you got to start over. (laughs) But just slow down and take 30 minutes with your kiddo and just be in their world Um, and just be curious. Even if, you know, if you're playing with your four-year-old on the ground and letting them pick the game and you just play along with them or whatever it is. Um, But the big piece is slow down and be present. Wow. That's so good. That's good. I, I didn't know that. That's that's good information. Only 30 minutes. I'm going to tuck that away. Mm-hmm. Anybody can do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's doable. Wow. I think we could do more than that. <laughs> Overachiever. But, over Overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Becca, give us a word from the Lord yes. as we get out of here. Give Let's us something. Let's do it. Um, as I was just kind of thinking before we sat down, um, and I was thinking about just how I feel as a parent. Um, and especially one who is following Jesus um, and how all of the things we're talking about is really good, but sometimes it can feel maybe slightly overwhelming or like, even if I have information, what if I can't execute it in that point? Or what if I don't do it in the right way? And so um, actually I had a scripture that came to mind, which is in Colossians um, chapter one, verses nine and 10. Um, And it says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. And so that is just my encouragement and prayer for you parents or parental figures in our church, those listening to the podcast, is that you're not doing this alone um, and you can turn to God and ask him for spiritual wisdom and understanding. Um, Part of our promise and inheritance as Christians is that we have the Holy Spirit, God within us, um, walking with us every step of the way. So when we feel like we're not enough or when we feel like, how can I do this? Um, We know that God is with us and he is telling us in his word to ask for that spiritual wisdom and understanding. Um, 
And so parents, I just want to encourage you today. I hope that uh, as you wrap up this podcast here, that you feel like one, you can turn to God and ask him to help you. And two, that you have found something in this podcast that you immediately today can start doing. Um, I think we gave you a lot of really easy things that you could start implementing. Don't try to do them all at once. Like, let's just start with one thing. Um, We love you, church family, and we hope this has helped you. Have a great rest of your day. Peace. Go love the bill. (laughs) 